We've seen a lot of really crazy things happen in this past year. We try to figure out, well, it still looks now like the police How do we as Jesus followers respond to some of the ideas and events that have happened within our culture in this past season? Where do we align ourselves with what our culture is saying and doing? And where does following Jesus offer us an alternative, uncultured pathway? This is Uncultured. All right, what's going on you guys? Welcome to Youth Online and welcome to week seven of our series called Uncultured. Um, when Lee and I first got married, we had to learn and figure out how to live with one another. Marriage, you know, begins with a process where you gotta figure out what your spouse likes and dislikes and just the way you might live uh, in order to love your spouse well. So for Lee and I, uh, get this, our first big fight was over how to properly dispose of bacon grease. <laughs> but one of our larger fights or tension points in our marriage came shortly after the arrival of our son, Bo. And just FYI, your life will dramatically change when you have a kid. Surprise! Who would have thought? Before Bo came along, I had a lot of free time I could use that didn't really matter, you know? Uh, it didn't really affect my wife or anyone else. I, if I wanted to spend three hours or more out with my camera looking for owls, hey, I could do that without really any repercussions. But when Bo arrived, my absence meant that Leah had to look after a new baby on her own if I went out. So I had to figure out, we had to figure this out together. And I wanted to continue to have that freedom of being able to go out on my own, uh, by myself, have my alone time, right? Be able to relax, refresh, renew, spend time with God. And eventually, this actually led to an argument over how much time I spent off in the woods looking for birds while my poor wife, you know, was stuck inside with a screaming newborn covered in poop. Now, I could have said that I wanted to continue to have the freedom of being able to get out by myself, have all that alone time, the time to relax, refresh, right? Because it's part of who I am, it's my right, it's my personality. And if I don't get that time, I'm grumpy and stressed and yada yada yada. I could have said that. And I, I, I think I did at first. But if I love my wife and I want to show her that I love her, is saying all that stuff really going to communicate that I actually love her? Well, long story short, I love my wife. And to show her that I love her, I had to recognize where my actions and my choices were causing her harm. And I had to give up some of my time off birding. I had to give that stuff away. I love her. Therefore, I am going to make sacrifices of my own time and preferences for her benefit. Now, today we are talking about love. We're comparing the things that we've seen in this past year with the ways of Jesus. And here's a little spoiler for where we're going to go tonight. The world's version of love and the Jesus version of love, guess what? They're not the same. The Jesus version of love is selfless, sacrificial, and difficult, while the world's version of love is selfish, self-serving, and easy. Love used to be defined as this like will for the good of another, right? But today, anything that makes someone else uncomfortable in our easily offended culture is considered unloving, which goes back to our discussion on tolerance last Friday. The way I've seen it played out in our world is that to love someone, you gotta like blindly accept that person and whatever they believe, even if his or her beliefs contradict your own, right? Like, even, or even if it contradicts reality, because self-realization, like learning who you are, is now the ultimate goal in our culture, right? It's all about what you feel, <laughs> and that defines you. So a married person might say, hey, I am what I feel, and my feelings have changed for this person I've been married to for 10 years. So that must mean that, uh, oh, we should separate now. Logic like this is why we're seeing divorce rates just skyrocket like 50 times greater than it was like, you know, 50 years ago. So why is it that our culture celebrates love so much, yet something like a divorce rate is so high? Why do we say love is love and yet we're so divisive? Like, love is the answer. Love is all you need, right? But it's so funny because we have this very skewed and limited understanding of love, don't we? Like our English language, it, it, we've got one word for this vast, complicated, multi-dimensional concept. Like, I love my mom. <laughs> Sharon, she's great. But I also love pizza. 
Like, we have one word for obviously two different types of love. In ancient Greek, there were four different words for love. For one, there was phi philia. I didn't take Greek, so I might butcher this. Philia, which is a brotherly love. There was also eros, which is the sexual side of love. There was storge, which is the natural, like, instinctual affection, um, like the way a mother or father loves a child. And there was agape love, which is unconditional willful love. So just keep that in mind for, you know, keep that in mind for later. So is love really all you need? Like, what does society mean when they say love is love? And, and what kind of love is it? Is it the same kind of love that you would have for, you know, tacos or, or, or Justin Bieber? Or is it something more? If you have any sort of knowledge about Jesus, then you may know some of his teachings around love. Uh, Jesus was pretty famous for, you know, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. And one time... Someone asked Jesus what the greatest commandment in the Jewish scriptures was. Like, what is the most important thing? And this guy was one of the religious leaders that asked him, right? He wanted to trick Jesus into saying something they could use against him later on. And Jesus answered him with this. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. That is the greatest commandment right there, right? And this is actually a quote from the Hebrew scripture in Deuteronomy. It's a prayer known as the Shema. Shema, that's a great word. If we were in person, I'd make you say the Shema right now. But, um, and this is something that most of the Jews would have repeated each and every day, like literally religiously, right? It was a well-known thing that they were to love God. And that's demonstrated through obedience to his commandments. So everyone listening to Jesus at this point would have been like, Yeah, Jesus, yeah, love God, preach, buddy. They would have all been happy and agreed. But then Jesus takes it to another level. He says this, The second is equally important. Wait, what? Second? Second command? No, Jesus, I said, what's the greatest commandment? Not commandments. It's not supposed to be t one, one commandment, Jesus. Jesus says the second is equally important. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. And the second commandment that he gave, that's also a quote from the Hebrew scriptures. Straight out of the book that everyone just loves to hate. It was right from Leviticus 19, 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. So which one was the greatest commandment? Was it to love God or, or was it to love your neighbor? Jesus says, uh, yes, <laughs> it's the same thing, like both. They are two sides of the same coin. Your love for God is expressed in your love for people and the other way around. You cannot separate them. And Jesus demonstrated this with his life. He didn't just say it, he lived it. Love is an action, a choice that you make to seek the well-being of others before yourself, especially without expecting anything in return. Uh, there's a really cool passage that we're going to look at that describes the way of Jesus, um, the way he loved and how he calls us to love. Uh, it's written by the Apostle Paul, who knew all of the guys who hung out with Jesus the most. And he says love is the greatest thing in this verse here in 1 Corinthians 13. So let's take a look together. Busting my old Bible today. One time this Bible got um, just totally covered in Dr. Pepper on the way to a youth retreat in my bag. The pop can exploded on the bus because I think I kicked it. All right, so it says this, verse four to seven. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. That's such a beautiful um, description of love, isn't it, right? Like it's probably been read at many of your parents' weddings and uh, it was even read during Jim and Pam's wedding in the office, right? Like even our culture sees that this is a beautiful description of love and yet I often see it playing out so differently in the relationships that I see out there, right? Like where, where Paul says love is patient, I, I would say that many relationships, as soon as the feeling, the spark is gone, well then it disappears so then it becomes temporary. Right, where, where love is kind, according to Paul and the, and the scripture, it's very conditional in our world. It's conditional based on what we get out of it. Is it reciprocated, right? It, you know, love in here is generous. It's modest. And yet in the world, I see it being envious, 
and boastful, and I could go on and give a whole bunch of examples. Guys, this is a beautiful and countercultural description of what love is and should look like. But I think if this was the definition of love that married couples lived by, well, I wonder if there would be greater marital satisfaction and less divorce. And it's not just a type of love for married couples, okay? No, this is the DNA that makes up any kind of loving relationship. It's, it is for friendship, for, for brotherhood, how, or for how a parent should love a child and for how a child should love a parent, right? This is for how we treat those who are not like us or who we even consider to be our enemies. This is a huge calling, a very high bar, and yet, there's another one of Jesus' followers who takes the concept of love even further with three little words that changed everything. Now, I know you're probably thinking like, oh my goodness, Kate, Brad, dude, like, th the stuff that Paul just wrote there, like, that's an impossible standard. Like, I can't live up to that. How could God expect this of me, right? Like, hang on, hang on. Just wait to see what the Apostle John writes. Now, John is cool because unlike Paul, John knew Jesus personally. He was there when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and, and healed the blind and the sick. He was at Golgotha when Jesus was hung on the cross. Like he promised to take care of Jesus' mother after Jesus died. He was also one of the very first people to, appear, to look into Jesus' vacant tomb. He saw it all and he lived to tell about it. In fact, he's the only one of the 12 disciples to not have been executed as martyrs for their faith. He may have been the last guy alive when he wrote what we now have in the book of 1 John in our modern day Bible. So here's what it says in 1 John 4, 7, and 8. Are you ready? Because like, like this one's a game changer. Okay, here it goes. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God for God is love. Did you catch the three little words that change everything when it comes to love? Did you get it? It was kind of subtle. It was right at the end. It says, God is love. This idea that God is love is what makes the Jesus version of love so different and so much better than the love or idea of love that our culture says or that the world offers. The fact that God is love is what makes loving like this even possible. God is love. That means that everything that God does comes from an outpouring of himself. His love, the acceptance, the forgiveness, the way he speaks to us, even the corrections and the guidance that he gives comes from an outpouring of himself. And this idea that God is love, this is what had such a huge impact on the first century Western world. The idea that God is love is uniquely Christian. Because the pagan gods of Jesus' time, they were fickle and jealous and, and scheming, immature. They, they meddled in human affairs just for fun. And even for the Jews, the God, the God the Father was, was holy, separate, hidden. He lived behind a curtain in the temple in Jerusalem and in many ways was, was almost unapproachable and unknowable. His love was reserved for like his covenant people. And so for John to say God is love was just totally bonkers. Plus, it's even more amazing considering what John faced in his lifetime. Uh, scholars believe that when John wrote this document, after it was after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. The Romans not only destroyed the temple at the time, but they also just wiped out a huge portion of the Jewish people in Jerusalem. It's crazy. And it's likely that John's buddies, Peter and Paul, they've probably been executed in Rome for their faith, along with countless other Jesus followers. So why on earth did John equate God with love after all he had witnessed around him for following Jesus? Like, why did he insist that God was love? Well, because Jesus was love. And John knew Jesus. And Jesus said he was God. You, Jesus said, you want to know God? I'm as good as it gets. It's me right here. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Guys, John saw love personally through Jesus. Jesus is love personified. Like John looked love in the eye. He watched love lived. He watched him mistreated. And, and, and he knew that life is difficult, cruel, harsh, and unjust. But God is love because Jesus is love. So knowing this, can, can we go back to our first passage from 1 Corinthians 13 with that new perspective in mind? If God is love, then I think we could actually reread our passage like this. God is patient and God is kind. 
God is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. God does not demand his own way. God is not irritable and keeps no record of being wronged. God does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. God never gives up. God never loses faith. God is always hopeful. And God endures through every circumstance. God never fails. What's so cool about this is that this is the kind of love God pours out on you and me. This is the kind of love that he has shown us through Jesus and through his death on the cross. You guys, he laid it all down for us so that we might live. And if you thought earlier that this, this type of love is too lofty, like too difficult to attain, too impossible for us to live up to, well, congrats, you're right. Why? Because it's describing God, not you, not your ability to love. It's describing his. And God knows this. He knows that we're going to fail to love others in a way that is always patient, always kind, always humble, always enduring, right? He knows. And that's exactly why he came as the person of Jesus. Because here's the thing. The closer we get to God, the more we are able to love like this. Actually, John continues in his book. Crap, I've got to flip back there now. At verse 16 in chapter 4, he says, God is love, again. And all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. There, and there's another place in here earlier on where he says that if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Guys, that means... That means that as we follow Jesus, as we grow in our relationship with him, as we get to know his heart better and become more obedient to him, his spirit enables us to love like he does. You can't do it by yourself. We totally can't do it on our own. It it goes against our our sinful nature, right? But that's the hope we have in Jesus. He leads us and he guides us into a loving relationship with him so that we can go and love in the same way. And then John also says this, Dear friends, since God loved us, we ought to love one another. Therefore, the Christian faith, like following Jesus, it's all about believing that there is an all-powerful God who overflows with his love for this world. That means that our purpose is to receive this love through Jesus and then give it back to others around us with an others-focused, self-giving love, the agape love that we learned about earlier. According to Jesus, Paul, and John, all is well if we love well. Our devotion to God is demonstrated and authenticated by how we treat people. God's love for us obligates us to go out there and to love those who God loves. And who does God love? According to scripture and Jesus, everyone. So let me ask you, who have you had a hard time loving recently? You've been stuck at home in close proximity to your little sister. (laughs) How have you been treating her? Or how about your parents? Have you been treating your parents well during this pandemic? What's your attitude like when they ask you to, you know, take a break from your video games and help you clean up from dinner? Or let's go a little further. What's your attitude like when they set a curfew on how much time you get to spend with your boyfriend? Or, or how do you treat your classmates or your teachers or your coworkers? How about those you don't like who annoy you or mistreat you or make fun of you? Jesus said that the ultimate test of our love is how well we treat those that we can't stand. So is love all you need? Love is love. Love is the answer. Well, yes, but love is Jesus. Jesus is all you need. God is love and the cross is the answer. So let's love like him. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the way you have loved us. Thank you that you died on the cross to show us how far you were willing to go to prove to us your love. God, you are so good and and to know you is to know love. So I pray that we would come to know you deeper and better so that we could go out into this world and love each other better. Our culture is dying for love. The people around us in this world are aching to feel that they are loved unconditionally. So God, would you help us to do that? Would you help us to love everyone around us, including those that we have a hard time being around? Jesus, thank you so much for this time, for, for coming and speaking through me and through these to our kids, to our youth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay.
voice is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. Well, you guys, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I hope you had a good time, and I hope you enjoyed this discussion on love. We're going to continue our good times over on Zoom, so feel free to click on the link in the description below. We're just going to do one call this week. Uh, We'll hang out, play some games together, and then we're going to split off into some breakout rooms for junior and for senior youth. Uh, Because there is a further discussion to be had on this big topic of love, and uh, we really want to dive into that with you. As always, we're going to be doing a QA and a later this week, so send us your questions in. If you've got comments or want to know some more uh, about this particular topic, let us know, and we're going to answer them later on this week. Also, super excited, because later this month, on June 25th, we are holding our ultimate end of the year youth night we are going to be gathering in person at the hurley's farm on friday june 25th from 7 30 until 9 p.m and we're going to be having a campfire and some games some worship and teaching and just hangout time in person so we cannot wait we're very happy because the government has allowed uh, churches religious organizations to be able to gather for religious services outside with any number provided that we are socially distanced. So we're gonna be doing all of that, following all the COVID protocols, just so that everyone is safe. But man, you can sign up for that already. Head on over to wmbchurch.ca slash youth and get your butt signed up. Well, thanks for joining us. It's been a great time. We will see you guys again next Friday and stay tuned because there will be more online content coming out this week, including episode three of the Youth Pastor Vlog. Hope you've been enjoying that. I think it's hilarious. My wife makes fun of me for vlogging. 
which is fine. She makes fun of me for a lot of things. I just kind of go with it now. I love her. She loves me. Yeah. Love. Love you guys, and I will see you again next Friday. <laughs>